Video games. Video games. Now, I could start this video by gushing over how ridiculously good 2017 was for games, but if you've been keeping up with game reviews for the year's releases, I think I'd just sound redundant. And I mean, we did have a few disappointments in the mix, but they were pretty mild in the long run, let's be real here. And while 2017 was pretty mixed in terms of my personal life, it was fantastic for me in terms of games. Not only did I finally get a PS4 and actually kept up with some of the year's releases, I literally had to pull myself away to stop playing some of these games. That's how good this year was. And while there is certainly enough material for a bigger list than this, I had to cut it to a top 10 for personal reasons. So believe me when I say that the 10 games I've chosen for this list are really something special. Now, I'm not usually the kind of guy who jumps into difficult games without second thought. If anything, the difficulty can even be a turn-off for me. But there was something about Cuphead that just drew me in. And I mean, I guess I couldn't avoid playing the Dark Souls games for too long. What? All obvious jokes aside, Cuphead is a damn solid run-and-gun platform. The premise is that the main character Cuphead went a bit too far in the Devil's Casino and now he has to make up his loss by taking the souls of... people that are in debt to the Devil. And this is what the game is built on. It's essentially a glorified boss rush where you take on the debtors and attempt to take their souls by defeating them in battle. There's also a few platforming levels with a bunch of enemies, but don't tell anyone. The thing that makes Cuphead so enjoyable are its tight and simple gameplay mechanics combined with the raw challenge that the different bosses provide. Very rarely does it feel like death comes cheaply, and because the controls are responsive, the fault lies mostly with the player rather than bad design. Of course, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, Cuphead offers a very fair and enjoyable challenge. And how about that presentation? Every part of this game oozes charm, and the presentation as a whole, be it the art style, the sound design, or the music, makes you feel like you're playing through an old cartoon from the 30s. And it's that charm that I think makes me like this game so much. Even though I might be frustrated sometimes, nearly everything about this game just makes me smile. And that's without all the memes and jokes about Dark Souls. While I did play a lot of completely new games last year, most of my time was spent on catching up with the latest installment in some of my favorite franchises, now that I had a new gen console. With that, here's the first of many PS4 games on this list, Tales of Berseria. To some, Berseria is seen as return to form after Zestiria end up being lackluster. And while personally I think Zestiria was still a great game, Berseria is definitely a step up. The story, for one, while sharing some of the problems Hysteria had and bringing its own problems, is a lot more interesting with now being told from the villain's perspective, as the main character Velvet is trying to get revenge on Artorius Colbrand, who's being hailed as a hero for killing her brother. And as the story goes on, more is revealed about both Artorius' plans and the state of the world in general and it all makes for a fairly intriguing narrative. A colorful cast also helps, and like any Tales game, the main cast is a goddamn treat. It did take me a while to warm up to some of these characters this time around, but it was actually kind of refreshing. And in addition to the complexity of each character, the interactions they have are top-notch once again, making the characters that much more likable. The gameplay has had some revamping. Rather than having normal attacks and arts separated, or having two different art types, arts are your only method of attack, and they're divided into four chains, one for each action button. 
And while the combat can get a little monotonous because of this, trying out different chains and combining them with the new Break Soul mechanic makes battles still enjoyable and satisfying. And with a solid presentation of great voice acting, beautiful visuals, and another Tales soundtrack equivalent of sex, Tales of Berseria is definitely worth your time. While for me it wasn't quite as good as I hoped, it was still a fun time and definitely a step in the right direction for the series. Plus, Luffy said is an extremely good boy. So, let's talk about death. I mean, Danganronpa V3 killing Harmony. Once again, the kill train calls for high school students to a murder game as you watch your favorite characters all die one by one. Because God fucking knows I did. Anyway, as for the game itself, the basic formula is pretty much the same as before. The game is split into daily life, where you search around the premises and spend time with the other students, deadly life, where you investigate a murder, it should be pretty obvious, and the class trial, where you try to find the culprit by examining the evidence you've gathered and arguing about the case with the others. However, what sets V3 apart from its predecessors are the new gameplay mechanics implemented into the trials as well as its story and new cast of characters. Rather than following the theme of hope and despair from the past games, V3 focuses on truth and lies, which brings this series that much closer to Ace Attorney, and that can only mean good things. And the cast is overall just as likable as before, which naturally means more craving for death when they die. And even though I think they went a little overboard with the new trial mechanics, some of them, like the debate scrum and the lie bullet, feel satisfying and they flow well with each of the trials. And the returning mechanics feel just as great as before, I can still cut through everyone's words and it feels fantastic. But where the game knocks the previous games out of the park is with its presentation. With sharpened visuals and sprites, great character designs and amazing music and voice acting, V3 doesn't screw around when it comes to both looking and sounding great. And while the game left me mixed with the oversaturated gameplay mechanics, the conclusion not being as satisfying as I hoped, and other... disappointing aspects, I still enjoyed myself thoroughly. If you're into visual novels and good storytelling, definitely give this series a shot. Just don't play B3 first. I wish I had space guns. So after hearing that the Ratchet and Clank movie bombed horribly, I was starting to worry whether the new PS4 game based on the movie was really going to be good or not. And the mixed opinions I was hearing from some RNC fans certainly didn't help matters. However, after finally getting my grubby hands on the game, I can say that this is one of the best RNC games in years. Now granted, I won't deny that this game has problems. The story is just the plot of the movie, i.e. pretty uninteresting for the most part. They really butchered Chairman Drek, and I wish they would have recreated more planets from the first game because the game's pretty short. But all that said, Ratchet and Clank still manages to not only revitalize an aged PS2 classic, but also be a really fun game on its own merit. The game takes the mechanics established from RNC2 onwards, adds in some weapons from the original game, the future trilogy, and the mind of whoever designs new weapons for these games and mash them together in an all new adventure in a familiar setting. And the Raritarium upgrade system from Tools of Destruction has also been brought back, giving you more control over what features you want for your weapon. And fuck, this game is pretty hecking difficult. I mean, I played through the game on hard, but I still feel there's a noticeable difference in difficulty compared to the previous games. And last but not least, how about those visuals? This game looks like a Pixar movie! The animation is so well done, and the level of detail here is mind-boggling. I mean, I wish they'd emote more in the in-game cutscenes, but hey, I'll take what I can get. And the same can be said about the whole game, I'm more than satisfied with the end product. And since this game sold pretty well, maybe we'll see a similar reboot remake for RNC2 somewhere down the line. 
Time can only tell. Now you see, this is what we call natural progression. In 2015, I played Uncharted 2 and loved it. In 2016, I played Uncharted 3 and loved it. And last year, well, take a guess. So Uncharted 4 was one of the games I was most excited to play on PS4, partly because it was another Uncharted game, partly because I heard this was supposed to be the best game in the series, and partly because Troy Baker was voicing one of the major characters. And holy crap, Thieves End delivered on all fronts. The gameplay formula isn't much different from the previous installments. You jump on cliffs, look around for treasures, shoot down some baddies occasionally, and maybe solve a puzzle or two. However, not only does Uncharted 4 sharpen the gun combat and give the game a pretty smooth difficulty curve, but it also gives new tools for the players, such as the rope for the platforming segments and making stealth even more of a prominent option against enemies. But like the past Uncharted games, the story is what really pulled me in. So after the events of the third game, our hero Nate decided to settle down with his newlywed wife Elena, leaving his more questionable life behind. However, he's reunited with his brother Sam, who's still looking for a treasure they were hunting together several years ago when he supposedly died. Sam tells Nate that he needs the treasure to save his life. So Nate sets out on one last adventure to find the treasure in order to save his brother. And while the story can get a little predictable at times, it's definitely one of the better stories in the series and really shows Nate's growth as a character. And the incredibly conclusive and satisfying ending wraps it all in a nice little bow. So in case it wasn't obvious, Uncharted 4 was a great time, and I'd say it's probably my favorite in the series now. And Naughty Dog, if for some reason you're going to make Uncharted 5 someday, give us a new protagonist, okay? Let's take a little break from all these PS4 games and talk a little bit about Nintendo because gosh diddly dang they scored it big time last year. Not only did they release their new console, the Switch, but also some fantastic games to go along with it. And while I didn't get to play most of them because I can't afford two consoles in the same year, at least I still have the Wii U Swan Song. Well, technically. So I'm pretty sure you've heard the same song and dance about Breath of the Wild ever since it came out, but let me hammer it into your heads why this game is so good. As the first truly open-world 3D Zelda game, Breath of the Wild offers a massive overworld for you to explore, and pretty much from the beginning of the game no less. And thanks to different quests, main story or otherwise, the overworld doesn't feel empty in the slightest, and there's a prominent sense of discovery throughout the adventure. The open world isn't the only thing that makes the game though, the wild part of the title isn't there for nothing. You see, in Breath of the Wild, a lot of the new mechanics have something to do with survival in the wilderness, like switching clothes depending on the environment, cooking to create dishes that restore health, and taming wild horses for you to ride. All this makes the game that much more immersive, as it's a constant reminder that you're also fighting against the wilderness. Combined with some satisfying combat and fun puzzles in the shrines that utilize the different runes really well, Breath of the Wild is definitely both a great open world game and a great Zelda game. I'm not gonna say I didn't have any problems with the game, and I think I still prefer the more dungeon focused style of the past Zeldas, but I can still appreciate the game for what it is. And besides, if they'll someday make a Zelda that fuses these two styles, let's just say there's probably another empty wallet in my future. And I thought this game would have disappointed me. Guess I just never saw it coming. Persona 5 was always on the list of games I wanted to play last year, but since some of the stuff I had seen didn't really sit well with me, I was kind of skeptical. But all of those worries were swept away when I got the game for myself. 
Once again, the player character is a transfer student, but this time he has been charged with assault and is on probation. Soon things escalate and you find yourself in the metaverse with all these shadow monsters because smartphones are the devil. And after awakening to their personas, the main characters form the Phantom Thieves, a group that steals people's hearts. And this is the game's main premise, you go into the metaverse and steal distorted desires or treasures from people's palaces to make them have a change of heart and confess their crimes. And when everything comes together, it becomes a very gripping story. But the characterization is what really makes this narrative. Like the previous games, all the main characters are very likable and they feel human. But in addition, their struggles reflect the game's themes like rebellion and true justice, making the story that much more cohesive. The gameplay had some reworking as well. At its core, it's the same turn-based battling as before, but the battles now have better flow with multiple button commands and... I can switch party members in the menu? Suddenly I don't give a crap about all the other stuff. The exploration is also improved with the palaces having preset designs rather than just randomly generated floors, and the social links, or confidants, have been improved too, with each link having rewards the further you progress. Presentation-wise, the style of this game is crazy. Literally everything, even down to the menus, is stylized with the game's themes, and the soundtrack is... really good. So yeah, Persona 5 is pretty great. It's not without problems, and I still slightly prefer Persona 4, but it was definitely a well-spent 100 hours. Plus, any prolonged time with a beautiful marshmallow like Haru is good time in my book. Ever since the PS4 was released, the reasons for me to buy one just piled up on top of each other, what with new exclusive games coming out left and right. But there was one game I knew I wanted even before the release of the console, and that was one of the first games shown for the PS4, Infamous Second Son. As a fan of the first two games, Second Son caught my eye the second it was revealed. Following the events of Infamous 2 seven years later, the game stars a young man named Delson Rowe, who's a bit of a delinquent and constantly ends up arrested by his sheriff brother Reggie. But then a van carrying bioterrorists crashes near their home, things escalate, and now there's smoke coming out of Delson's hands. And after these DUP assholes fill Delson's friends full of concrete shards, Delson decides to leave for Seattle and get his hands on concrete powers to save his friends from certain death. The story isn't as engaging as, say, the first game, but learning about DUP's influence on the world and how Conduit's life went to shit during the last seven years is what keeps the story going nicely. And having someone like Delson as the lead certainly helps. In terms of gameplay, while I do prefer Cole's electric powers overall, the three types of powers that Delson gets, Smoke, Neon, and Video, are pretty creative and still fun to use. And mechanically, Second Sun is the most polished game in the series, with multitude of options to take on your enemies, regardless of which type of karma you have. And thanks to the aforementioned different powers that you can basically switch on the fly, the game never becomes stale. And thanks to side content packed throughout the city, there's definitely a lot to do even if you're not going for the 100% completion. So if it wasn't obvious enough, Second Sun is fantastic. I'm not sure whether or not it's my favorite in the series now, but if you have a PS4 and haven't played this game yet, you've been missing out big time. Morphogenetic fields, morphogenetic fields, morphogenetic fields, morphogenetic fields, morphogenetic fields. If there's one series that I could say took over my life for a good part of the last year, it would definitely have to be Zero Escape. I played all three games in the series and enjoyed all of them, even Zero Time Dilemma with all the problems it had. And since the Nonary Games collection exists, let's talk about both 999 and Virtue's Last Award. 
For those who don't know, the Zero Escape games are visual novels where the main gameplay, aside from pressing a single button 700 times, consists of room escape puzzles. And these puzzles are actually pretty freaking cool, as each room has a unique way of finding the answers and very rarely does it feel like the game's asking you to do something illogical that you couldn't have figured out on your own. They all require thinking both inside and outside the box and are just really fun brain teasers. But the story is really what takes the main role here. The premise of both games is that nine people have been trapped somewhere and are forced to play a variation of the Nonary game, where you put your life on the line to find the way out and have a bracelet with numbers on them. And what makes the story so good is the mystery that slowly unravels as you find out more about the nature of the game and the identity of the mastermind Zero. And having a cast of mostly great characters in both games helps a lot too. And to top it all off, the sound work is fantastic, with a great soundtrack for atmosphere, emotion and puzzle solving, and voice acting packed full of great delivery. So in case I didn't make it obvious, Zero Escape is more than worth your time, and with all games available for both PC and PS4, there's not a better time to jump in. Just be prepared for some major mindfucks near the end of these stories. I'm still recovering from Virtue's last reward. Since this year was so great for games, let me give you a good few honorable mentions. Nier Automata, Yakuza 0, Pokemon Ultra Sun and Moon, Layton's Mystery Journey, Dark Cloud, Rogue Galaxy, Firewatch, Metroid Prime 2 Echoes, Jack X Combat Racing, Gravity Rush Remastered, Horizon Zero Dawn, Zero Escape, Zero Time Dilemma, and Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. Welcome to the number one segment of this countdown, sponsored by Extreme Bias. I mean, I did debate on whether or not to include the Insane Trilogy, since they are remakes of games I've played before, but it'd just feel wrong to stick anything else but this trilogy at the top. You get me? Anyways, the reason why I think the Insane Trilogy deserves this spot is how successfully it manages to breathe new life to the PS1 classics. Not only did they make the games look prettier and more detailed than back in the day, but the physics of the games have also been smoothened, making them more enjoyable to play. Add that with a functional save system and not having to do a perfect run for the colorist gems and congratulations! You just made Crash 1 actually playable. And while there are some questionable design choices, like the two first games having time trials for levels that aren't designed to be rushed and altering some of the vehicle controls in Crash 3, these games are still very solid 3D platformers. Despite their new look, each game feels like the Crash Bandicoot we know and love, with all the charm and challenge of the originals intact. And I think I even have a newfound appreciation for these three thanks to this remake, cementing them as the definitive way to experience these classics. For me, at least. And really, I'm just happy that this trilogy even exists. Because not only does it do the brief new life thing, but it also marks the revival of the series. There's no confirmation whether or not a new Crash game is on the horizon, but seeing as the trilogy is currently one of the best-selling PS4 games, showing that the world still cares about the Bandicoot, I have hopes. And if Vicarious Visions can keep up the same level of quality for the future installments, sign me up and then some. I'm finished, Duck, and... I'm back! <sighs> yes, you are, buddy old pal. In the future, we'll decide If there's a hero buried deep inside I wanna be a hero
watching. By the time you see this, which hopefully isn't like 7 months into 2018, I've probably left for my conscription already. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, there's an update video in the description that goes into detail. It's also the reason why this was a top 10 and not a top 15. As for other projects, I have videos in the works, but because my access to internet and an editing software is limited, I have to ask you to be patient. Worst case scenario, you need to wait until July for a new video, but I think I can do better than that.